Good morning, everybody. Please have a seat. I've just got a few notices this morning. Uh, firstly, just to let you know, there will be no midweek communion this week. So please, you know, please come and have private prayer, uh, but there will be no communion. I'd like to welcome Ian Ma uh, from Sheffield Cathedral, who is going to lead our service today. Thank you very much, Ian. It's a pleasure. Um, just a reminder for next Sunday, uh, it is Bring Your Own Picnic Day in celebration of uh, the Platinum Jubilee. And uh, so we ask you to uh, bring your own picnic, uh, your drinks, although I think the, the hall will be open. And uh, if you fancy doing a turn, it would be lovely to share that experience. So, uh, you know, if you've got anything musical or anything like that, it'd be great just to have some fun and enjoyment after the service next week. Thank you. Oh, sorry, one more. Uh, bundling of Trio will be taking place this Friday uh, in church. So if there's any helpers, please come and uh, help to bundle Trio ready for delivery. Thank you. I published the bands of marriage between Theodore Michael Peter Pearson and Jennifer Lees, both of this parish. This is for the third and final time of asking if any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. So we pray for Theodore and Jennifer as they prepare for their wedding. Lord of love, be with them in all their preparations and on their wedding day. Give them your love in their hearts throughout their married life together. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. It's very good to be at Holy Trinity. I was ordained in this church, so it has a special place in my heart. It's nice to be with you. Some of you I've seen at St. John's uh, in recent weeks. Uh, today's readings help us think a little bit about the consequences of our faith, more of which a little later. Our opening hymn, number 26, Alleluia, sing to Jesus.
against our neighbour, in thought and word, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. We beseech you, leave us not comfortless, but send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to the place where our Saviour Christ is gone before who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from Acts chapter 16. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and bought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the most high God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. 
and it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Revelation of St. John the Divine. I, John, heard a voice saying to me, See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let everyone who hears say, come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies these things says, surely I am coming soon, amen. Come Lord Jesus, the <coughs> grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all the saints, amen. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to sing our next hymn, 277, Jesus Shall Reign Where'er the Sun, 277. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus looked up to heaven and prayed, Holy Father, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and those know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of our living and loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the things that struck me when reflecting on the reading set for this morning was the fact that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and his kingdom, has consequences. While it is possible to pay lip service and sit lightly to what being a follower of Jesus means, the reality is that it demands much more from us. Christian faith challenges us to realign our values and our relationships with the standards of the kingdom of God, which Jesus both proclaimed and embodied. It is a life-giving faith, but it demands from us a life of faithful service. It is also the adventure of a lifetime, during which we continue to develop and grow as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. From the moment we embark on the journey as his disciples, life can never be the same. Such a commitment compels us to look at the world in a different way, to see life through a different set of lenses, to march to the beat of a different drum. This is no easy path to follow, and there will be considerable obstacles to negotiate along the way. But it is the route to the fullness of life, which Jesus himself came to show us. And not only did he show us the way, he is the way. Christian faith has consequences not only for us, but also for those we encounter along the way, and with whom we share our faith in Jesus Christ. Because when the gospel message is heard and received, It has the potential to be life-changing for the recipient and also to have an impact on that person's family and friends, which cannot always be anticipated. The consequences can be far-reaching, not least because the gospel message is a challenge to the status quo. It is often disturbing and sometimes even disrupting. We can see this evident in the first reading from Acts. And we can also discern it in the words of Jesus to his disciples in the gospel reading from John. In the Acts reading, Paul and Silas are in Philippi and are being followed around by a young slave girl with the ability to tell fortunes. A girl who keeps interrupting them by announcing to all and sundry that they are disciples of Jesus the Messiah. For the owners of the girl, she was a good source of income someone to be exploited and used for their own ends. It's not easy to see just why Paul and Silas 
got so worked up about the girl's pronouncements as what she was saying was quite accurate. They were indeed, as the girl put it, slaves of the Most High God, who proclaimed to you a way of salvation. Maybe she was distracting people away from the disciples' message. They may also have recognized that her so-called fortune-telling ability was harming rather than helping her own spiritual well-being. In any event, Paul responds by commanding the spirit of divination that was in the girl to come out. The owners of the girl were unhappy, to say the least. Their nice little earner suddenly lost all her value. Unfortunately, we don't know the fate of the slave girl, but there would have been consequences resulting from her encounter with Paul and Silas. We can imagine her owner's anger, having lost her fortune-telling ability, and with it, her earning capacity. As both a slave and a girl, in that culture and context, her outlook would not have been good, and it leaves us pondering what became of her. My hope is that she became part of the Christian community left behind by Paul and Silas, and they cared for her. That outcome was certainly the case for many slaves in the early days of Christianity, as they found a group of people who loved and accepted them, regardless of their lowly place in society. I hope that was the case for the slave girl. As Christians, we must trust in the providence of God to care for those people whom we meet along the way and who respond to the witness of Jesus Christ that we bear through our words, our actions, and our presence in their life. As Jesus reminds us elsewhere in the Gospels, his message will cause division. Families, friends, communities may be split as some respond while some reject the good news. That's not an easy thing to hear. This realization was brought home to me many years ago through a conversation with a Mormon missionary whom over a period of six months or so, I came to know quite well. Elder Smith, that's not his real name, was a young man from Utah coming to the end of his compulsory two-year missionary service, something expected of anyone growing up in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to give the Mormon Church its full title. It seemed a little odd to be referring, <coughs> excuse me, to a 19-year-old as Elder Smith. So I managed to persuade him to tell me his first name, Alan. Now, the Mormons are not a mainstream Christian denomination holding unorthodox beliefs about the nature of God and the person of Jesus Christ. So not surprisingly, we had much to discuss and debate. Mostly, Alan would come along to our house with a missionary colleague, as is the Mormon approach. We always tried to show them hospitality, and they were certainly always glad of a meal. A month before he was due to return to Salt Lake City, Alan visited unexpectedly on his own. And he said words to this effect to me. I no longer believe in the teachings of the Mormon church in which I have grown up. In my heart, I now see the truth of the good news about Jesus Christ, and I want to follow him. But I'm shortly due to go back to my home in Utah, where all my friends and family belong to the Latter-day Saints. <clears throat> I will be expected to finish my studies at Brigham Young University and join my father's business. Over 90% of people in Utah are Mormons. If I tell them about my newfound faith, they will disown me, and I will probably have to move to another state to find work. What can I do other than return and try to figure things out from there? <coughs> the gospel has consequences. And I was left thinking, what on earth have I done by upsetting the equilibrium of Alan's life? I had no answer for him, and who was I to try and persuade him to do otherwise thousands of miles from home? My hope is that back in Utah, he connected with the Christian community, able to support him through the turmoil re resulting from his rejection of the Mormon faith and nurture him on the path of Christian discipleship. 
I never heard from Alan after his return to Salt Lake City, so may never know what happened to him. <coughs> but that experience lives with me as a constant reminder that the Christian faith has consequences that are not always easy to live with. Something that is true for both the one who is sharing the gospel and for the one receiving it. We don't know whatever happened to the slave girl in Philippi. And I don't know whatever happened to Elder Alan Smith. We do, however, know what the consequences of the gospel were for Paul and Silas. Persecution. The owners of the slave girl, incandescent with rage, contrived to get the disciples arrested, flogged and thrown into jail on trumped up charges, where they were held with their feet in stocks. What happens next is a study in how faith and unity in Christ provides the spiritual resources to face the most hopeless of situations. We find Paul and Silas not in a state of despair or anguish, but praying and singing hymns to God. That doesn't happen because of an intellectual assent to an idea, but because of being at one with the risen Christ. Paul and Silas were rooted in their faith and not shaken unduly by what befell them. Then comes the account of an earthquake and the potential for Paul and Silas to make their escape. When the poor jailer woke up and saw the cell door was open, he was about to kill himself by his own hand, knowing that the consequence for a prisoner escape was execution. Astounded by the fact that his prisoners had not fled the scene and affected deeply by the conduct of the disciples, the jailer himself ended up believing in Jesus, as did his family, and the whole household of the jailer was baptised that very night. The gospel has consequences. I wonder what influence the jailer had subsequently on his colleagues and also on the prisoners in his care as a result of his newfound faith. Any encounter with the gospel beyond the level of superficiality will affect the person's life, the consequences of which will be far reaching and life changing. The gospel pushes us out beyond our comfort zone because that is where following in the footsteps of Jesus inevitably takes us. That can sound disconcerting were it not for the presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the one of whom Jesus spoke to the disciples and who would be sent upon the church at Pentecost, the event we celebrate next Sunday. That was the reassurance being given by Jesus in chapters 14 to 17 of John's Gospel, from which our reading came this morning. Known as the farewell discourse, it is an important passage in which Jesus speaks plainly and realistically to the disciples about the consequences that would result for them if they follow in the footsteps of Jesus. In those chapters, Jesus tells of how his disciples will, like him, experience the hatred of the world and experience suffering and sorrow. Yet through it all, they would be held within the love of God. They would know the fellowship of the church and they would be strengthened and comforted by the Holy Spirit. Yes, they would know hardship and their discipleship would bear a cost, but equally they would share in the glory of Jesus, perhaps the most important consequence of the gospel. So as we continue through this season of Ascension Tide, Remembering that interval between Jesus returning to heaven and God sending the Holy Spirit upon the church, may we reflect upon the consequences of the gospel in our own lives. In what ways do our lives, uh, do our lives differ because of the faith we profess? How do our words and deeds mirror the life of the Lord we serve? To what extent is the love and compassion of God shared with others through the way we live? Are we faithful in our Christian witness and service? In our answer to questions such as these, the consequences of the gospel for each of us will be plain to see. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us stand to declare our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God. Please kneel or sit for our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Christ has been raised from the dead. Death hath no dominion over him. Praise be to God. On this Sunday after Ascension, we begin with a simple prayer of thanksgiving by Rolf Waldo Emerson. For each new morning with its light, for rest and shelter of the night, for health and food, for love and friends, for everything thy goodness sends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We say two prayers to celebrate Christ's ascension. Saviour and Lord, by ascending into heaven, you showed yourself in glory to your disciples, and you also promised to come again in the same way as you have gone into heaven. Give us pure and devout hearts as we celebrate your ascension, that we may continually ascend to a better life in you, that when you come in judgment, we may see your face and not be put to shame. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dearest Lord God, our merciful Father in heaven, we see that this festival of the ascension of our Lord Christ is full of comfort and joy. And for this, we praise and thank you. We pray that you would keep us in your grace and finally grant us a blessed end for the sake of Jesus Christ, your son, that we may follow where he has led us and enjoy eternal life and salvation, sitting at his right hand. Grant this to us, dearest Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer asking for guidance. God be in my head and in my understanding. God be in my eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my heart and in my thinking. God be at my end and at my departing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
and two prayers for peace. The first being for peace in Ukraine. We pray for peace in Ukraine. We pray that this senseless suffering may be brought to an end. Christ, shine your light where there is hopelessness and despair. We pray for peace in Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The second prayer for peace is by St. Francis. Lord, make us instruments of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. For thy mercy and thy truth's sake, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now let us take time for those, to pray for those we hold dear. May those dear to us be blessed. May they be comforted. For all those we love, wherever they may be, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Come, O Spirit of God, and make within us your dwelling place and home. May our darkness be dispelled by your light, and our troubles calmed by your peace. May all evil be redeemed by your love, all pain transformed through the suffering of Christ and all dying, glorified in his risen life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our parish with our diocesan prayer. Living God, Jesus calls his followers to seek first your kingdom. Renew us as we make your love known. Release us to share freely together in mission and rejuvenate us to be fruitful in your service. Give us courage, wisdom, and compassion that, strengthened with the grace of the Holy Spirit, we may, as the Diocese of Sheffield, both flourish and grow through Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And a closing prayer, asking Christ to accompany us as we tread the path he has taken to heaven. Jesus, our master, walk with us on the road as we yearn to reach the heavenly country so that following your light, we may stay on the way of righteousness and never wander in the darkness of this world's night while you, the way, the truth, and the life are shining within us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. May Christ bless us and save us all. Amen. Do you please stand for the peace? The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. The peace of the risen Christ be always with you. And in a way that is appropriate for you, let us offer one another a sign of peace. Peace be, peace be with you. I'm going to sing another hymn now, 480, The Head That Once Was Crowned With Thorns, 480.
Please do feel free to sit. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. And now we give you thanks that after he had ascended far above all heavens and was seated at the right hand of your majesty, he sent forth upon the universal church your holy and life-giving spirit, that through his glorious power, the joy of the everlasting gospel might go forth into all the world. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, <clears throat> these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, call into mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom, all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
Let us pray. Eternal God, giver of love and power, your Son Jesus Christ has sent us into all the world to preach the gospel of his kingdom. Confirm us in this mission and help us to live the good news we proclaim through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. The Spirit of truth leads you into all truth. Give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and strengthen you to proclaim the word and works of God and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Our closing hymn number 81, Christ Triumphant Ever Reigning.
in the peace of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.